Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Hype with Black Enterprise. I'm your host, Alfred Edmund Jr., Senior Vice President and Executive Editor at Black Enterprise. And as always, I have a great topic and a great guest. Listen, this episode of Beyond the Hype is brought to you by our friends at New York Life. Now, you guys know me. If you've been watching this show for now going on four years, or you just know me because you know me, you know I have a passion for style. I have a passion for fashion. Um, my One of my original career goals was to end up at uh, as one of the first black, if not the first black editor at GQ or Esquire. Um, I ended up at Black Enterprise, which is perfect because this is the way they expect us to dress at the E. But, uh, you know, it, it's still a very strong passion of mine. If you follow me on social, you'll see one of my hashtags I use all the time is I choose style. Um, I fell in love with fashion. I was probably three years old, my mother put me in a bow tie and a fedora, and that was all she wrote. So I say all that to tell you how excited I am whenever I have a fellow, what I call is a style brother on the show. And I want to welcome to the show, Travis Schuler, Managing Director of Suit Yourself Custom Apparel and Menswear out of South Carolina. I got some good things to say about fashion in South Carolina too, so we'll get into that. All right, all right, um, all welcome right. to the show, Travis. Thank you, thank you for having me. Appreciate you um, doing that uh, that intro, and I was excited because me and you are like brothers. Because you say you have a passion for fashion, that's actually my motto here at our store. Oh, so bad, bad. You have Kendra Spears. Well, I know our audience will get to learn a lot about you um, at the Black Enterprise because I believe you were you're featured in our Plan to Prosper campaign, where we're telling some of your story as a as an entrepreneur and as, as a person. Um, but for those who don't have the benefit of seeing that or, or yet. Tell us a little bit about uh, your company, Suit Yourself Custom um, Menswear and Apparel. Sure. Yeah. Um, again, like you said, we are Suit Yourself Menswear and Custom Apparel located in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, we are the premier clothing st- men's clothing store here in Columbia, South Carolina. So we feature, uh, I call myself Mr. Haberdasher, and I get asked that question all the time. What does that mean? I say we focus on the entire man from head to toe. So our specialty is everything. We, we uh, pride ourselves in being a one place that you can get everything uh, for, again, for Premier uh, Men's Clothing. Well, I, I guess I told you a little bit about what my, my you know, passion for fashion and style. I tell people my mother was my first stylist um, over the years. I mean, I, I actually had my own bow tie line for a while um, in, the, in the late 2010s, early you know 2010s. Uh, um, I, there's another um, black-owned custom clothier that's in South Carolina. I think he's in Greenville, um, A. Smith Clothiers, that I that I, I love his stuff. Um, but tell me about when when did you first know that this was a space you might want to be in? Was it early in life? Was it later in life? Talk to me about just your whole, your, your the idea of fashion as your passion, and then eventually it becoming uh, the business that you're in. Well, um, the, the irony is it's, it's kind of like your same storyline. Um I just grew up around clothing. My mother is a clothing connoisseur. Uh, she always uh, loved to dress from her business attire to her church attire to pretty much the whole thing. I, I always uh, jokingly tell people that I lived in the clothing store for my mother because she would go in the dressing room with tons of clothing, trying on different things. And I had to sit in that one little chair. And if you're a man, you know, when you go to the store with your significant other or your wife, there's that chair that's sitting right there and you seem like you're there all day. That was me as a child. So uh, the irony is, I guess, just from watching her, I actually learned how to put things together as far as coordinating. So I attribute a lot of things uh, that I uh, have as far as my business is concerned, and I get it from my mother. So as far as coordination, putting colors together. And so the irony is I always love to dress just because I got it from her. So Again, when I transitioned into my uh, to, to being a business owner, uh, it was it was an easy transition, but it's just something that was natural to me because a, a lot of if you, if you know my background. My background was actually IT, so I was a software developer for 17 years, and so uh, you know when I transitioned, I never really went into this business thinking I was going to run it full time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we basically had an online clothing store. And we would, that was our sole purpose to keep our, you know, to keep our, our nine to five and just have this selling clothes online. And even when we transitioned to go into a building, because uh, we started getting a lot of inquiries locally. Hey, where's your store? I want to shop. And, and, and the story of, oh, we're only online kind of got old real quick. 
So when we opened up the store, it was never with the intention of running it full time. But just uh, once we got it open and got the, de the demand was there, we had to make a decision. And so we transitioned into to being a full men's clothing store full time. Uh, and, and I've been doing that for the last 14 years. You know, I, I, I'm like you, I, as much as I love fashion and style when I was young, but it really was about dressing and, and, and have, being very particular. And, but I get it. If you like to dress, if you like and you're very particular about the way you put things together, you do want to shop. Now, I do appreciate the convenience of ordering online. I do. But I, I, I enjoy going into, like I said, a haberdashery or, you know, and, and like, oh, ooh, that, that is great. Right. And this is unique. And I didn't see this anywhere. And, and so it's interesting how, yes, you know, the current trend is to do a lot of online retail and you still got to have that. But yes, be able to create and capture a retail experience for those who have a passion for for the what you're selling. It just it, it speaks to me that the demand created the opportunity for your um in in in, in person retail. Right, absolutely. That that's exactly um you 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 said it in a nutshell that the the type of clients that we actually have while they do shop online, the, most of them like that personal touch. So that's the one thing that separates us from you don't you don't get that personal feel. Um, some people like the look, feel, and we'll go from dressing the guy all like, again, we call ourselves a haberdasher from head to toe. So when he's coming, you know, he doesn't want to have to get his item in. Now he's got to shop all over town for the accessories. We have everything. So that's kind of our niche that we actually provide a one-stop shop for, um, you know, for men to actually purchase all of their items in one place. From a yeah, I have this saying I tell people, you know, I say, what's the difference between fashion and style? I said, fashion is caring about the suit. Style is all about the accessories. That's it's exactly how you right. make it unique to you. Like you, every, two, the same guy can wear the exact same suit. It can look good on them, but it's the accessories that makes it personal. So I'm big Absolutely. into you know, pocket squares, cufflinks, pocket watches. We already talked about bow ties because I wear straight ties too. Um, I like anything that, that adds to the uniqueness of my own presentation, including unusual colors. My my yes. favorite favorite color is actually one of the colors in this jacket. It's very hard to find in men's clothing, but periwinkle. So, like, if I see anything that's a periwinkle, I'm like, let me get that because I know that's going to work it in. Oh, but, again, it's about the individualization of how you express and represent yourself to the world that makes style style. That's right. That's exactly right. And we do so, have that periwinkle in the store, by the way. <laughs> oh, oh, trust me. Don't think I'm not coming down to see you. Like I said, it's not like... I ain't been yeah. to South Carolina to get stuff before. So, yeah. so you, you hold that thought. I'm going to be up in your space sooner rather than later. To it. Yeah. So, so you know, one of the recurring themes of Beyond the Hype when I get to um, talk to um, entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs who are very in, in a space that's not only about their business but about their passion, is, is what I call getting into the money mindset of people like what is the mm -hmm. journey that took you yeah you had a love for fashion but that didn't necessarily mean you had to start a business lots of people and certainly lots of black men love to dress but you know entrepreneurship was a very specific path like you said you had an it career that you kind of transitioned um to to your current role so i kind of want you to walk the beyond the hype audience through your kind of your money journey you know the lessons and relationships and the beliefs did you have maybe when you were young growing up um, how that informed your choices in terms of pursuing the career you pursued, um, how how you look at um, money and, and whether it's your business or other things today, and what do you, what do you see going forward um, in terms of the legacy that you hope to leave for the future? And, okay. and, 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 and our goal with these types of conversations to help the audience to get into like people's like, well, how, why did how did that person think about these choices and these decisions, and where did those things come from? Uh, so, so let's start with with you know what what, did, what were your early lessons about money and or entrepreneurship um, as you remember them that informed your career choices, your professional choices, and your and your life choices. Well, I guess in the early in early beginnings, again, you you'll hear me um, give credit you know to my mother a lot. You know, she came from uh, a business background. You know, her my my all of my family on her side were most of them are entrepreneurs. Um, and my family actually was the first African-American fam uh, family or company to have a cab company here in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. So my grandfather was pretty much the, uh, the, the management behind 
uh, a lot of that. And so my mother would often tell me that she she would actually he would sit her down and give her a lot of financial lessons and a lot of things that she actually got from him. She put in place in her life. You know, number one, don't live beyond your means, you know, um, try to make sure you put something aside during those hard times. And, you know, just little nuggets like that that she got from him and she took it and applied it to her life. And so as I got older, you know, she would take me around a lot of uh, she would take me to a lot of her financial seminars. Now, while at the time, while you're young, you're figuring, oh, my gosh, why am I coming? Why am I coming? Why is she taking me to these to these type of seminars when it's not applicable to me, to me right now because I'm just a kid? But I think it was just her wanting to surround me, you know, so things can sound familiar as you know, as you get older. So it's almost like you have you ever been to a point where you've been around something for so long that even though you feel like it's boring and you can't get anything out of it, it, it gets embedded into your memory, into your long term memory. And so I think that's what happened. So I can again, I can contribute a lot of everything that I kind of know today or everything that I know, plus what I've added on top. I can kind of attribute to my mother. Uh, her name is Cynthia. And so she took me around a lot of a lot of just she kept me in the environment. So as we transition up, you know, the one thing I can say is I think if we just have make sure we're nurturing and have have those type, type of conversations with our family and keep that conversation familiar as as they get older, I think it'll it'll stick because it'll be ingrained in their brain. And so when it so when I, you know, she always told me, hey, make sure you save some money. Make sure you don't live beyond your means. Hey, if times get hard. You know, you may have to take on go, if you lose your job, you you know, don't have your lifestyle built so high that you can't go get a, a, a you know, a job working at a grocery store until times times, you know, switch over. And, right. you know, thank God I've never had to do that. That always kind of stuck with me, you know, to number one rule, number one, to live within your means, you know. So that's always been one of those things that kind of carried me, you know, through as I transitioned through my career. And then when I. uh made the decision to actually quit my job to go and run my business full time. Mm, yeah. Now we know as entrepreneurs, you're not going to make the money that you, that you would potentially make in the corporate world. So I had to kind of take a step back and, and assess to say, okay, what's the minimum amount of money that I can live on? Now, mind you, I got a wife and two young babies mm. when I, when I transitioned out to actually go, you know, start my business. So I had to kind of come up with a number. And I had to say, OK, this is the number. And I, you know, I'm not ashamed to say I had to take a twenty thousand dollar pay cut in, when I when I went to start my business. But I had to mentally prepare myself for that. So as I transitioned, that taught me a lot, even, you know, as a business owner to always put some money aside, you know, when you're actually, um, you know, growing through your business. Because, you know, one of the things you're going to be making a lot of money sometime and you're not going to be making any money. So it all kind of balances out. So I think that was kind of my beginning journey you know, to, to, I guess, my life lessons early on about the fundamentals of money. Um, so, you know, that, that, that was kind of my foundation. Well, you know, I, I, I've interviewed so many entrepreneurs over the years, and you hit on a couple of themes that I think are just very important um, that they've shared, too. Um, but first of all, you know, um, this idea of money as a language, and it's never too early to learn that language or teach that language to kids, you know. Um, uh, now, I, I came from a very much a, a working class community. Mostly the men in my family were mostly military guys and women were nurses. So I didn't really get exposed to real entrepreneurship until I was, you know, after college, really. Mm -hmm. But because of the values in those families, I also grew up with the, you know, don't spend money you don't have, live on your, your, your means, put something to a side. You never know what's gonna, uh, what, what it's going to be. Um, but beyond that, um, and I'm thinking of a, a good friend of Black Enterprise that I've interviewed on, on my other show, Your Money, Your Life, Ross Mack, who's known on Instagram for talking about um, financial topics with his toddlers in the backseat. And he's like, mm -hmm. well, what do you think? What do you think about this? And he kind of knows they don't really know. But to your point, it's like any language. When you're a baby, you hear people talking around you at first. You have any idea what they're saying. But eventually exactly. you're like, oh, that means daddy. <laughs> that means mama. That means milk. That means, you know, and, you know, if, right. if we understand that, then you're right. We get exposed, if we get exposed 
or we expose young people earlier, at the time they won't understand what you're saying. But you're right. When right. things click, and they, I tell people things click faster than you think. Um, my rule is that as soon as they learn how to count and ask for things, it's time to start teaching them about money because <laughs> they're really talking about spending. And they, they can right. get that, you know. But uh, the, the other thing I, I wanted to, you know, kind of get your, your, your take on is um, one of the, I've, I've written a, a forward to the book, to one of my um, friends and mentees, and it's called The Four Financial Languages. Um, mm-hmm. And the interesting premise of that book is that um, people speak different languages even in money. So we already talked about money as a language. But her, the premise of her book is that even within that language, if, you know, different people have different languages in that within that language. She breaks it down as spenders, savers, givers, and investors. That right. most people have a dominant personality in terms of how they handle money. Now, she wrote the book from the standpoint of helping, you know, significant others or husbands and wives, you know, not bump heads over finances because, you know, if one person is thinking from a giving standpoint, the other person is thinking from a spending standpoint. Right. You know, nobody's right or wrong, it's your orientation. Talk to me, if you if you will, what would you think was, was your orientation as you grew up? Um, I know my orientation was saver. I have a saver mentality. I had to, I had mm-hmm. to get used to the idea of investing. I had to get used to the uh, kind of giving wasn't hard because my mother was big into tithing and you right. know, doing things to help the community. But I learned eventually that my dominant money personality was saving. And then I, I kind of learned to adapt those other personalities into my life as I grew and evolved. But what would you say is your your money personality growing up, and what would you say it is now if it's changed? At well, all? well, I think it it, it, it kind of it's kind of all of us. Um, mm. Save from a saving savings was our was my dominant language, right. because as a young person or as a younger person, you were under the care of your parents, mm-hmm. and you know you. My mother used to always get on my case that, you know, hey, I get I would go ask her for something, and she would say, well, didn't I give you money? Well, I don't want to spend my money, you know. I want to spend yours. <laughs> so, I, I would guess saving was, you know, I was I wasn't stingy, but I just didn't want to spend my own money. So I think that would probably be my dominant. Um, I wasn't necessarily a big spender. Uh, it wasn't until, you know, later on in life, you know, uh, when my mother started talking about saving for the future or or saving, it it, it hit home. Where when I first got my first, what I would consider my real my real job as a career in IT, you know, um, she kind of sat back and watched. You know, I was shopping all the time, and because you know you're making the kind of money you never really made. You know, although I was saving, and she sat me down and she said, "Well, how how, how much money are you are you saving?" And I couldn't really give her a concrete number. And she said, "Well, you're living under my roof because I was living I was still living at home at the time." She said, uh, you should be saving 50% of your income. And I thought that was a that was a dagger to my heart. There's no way. There's no way on God's green earth I can save 50% of my income. She said, okay, well, fine. If you, you either save 50% of your income or you can pay me rent to live here. So that was a hard lesson, but that was an easy choice to make, of course. Um, so it, it got me in the mindset of learning how to save the majority of your income, you know, and because she because what she did say was, hey, one day you're going to have a family and you're not going to be able to save that kind of money. So while you're single, you don't have any major responsibilities. Um, you should be saving at least half of your half of your income. Um, and that was a tough that was a tough pill at, in the beginning. But if, of course, when I sat down and really looked at it, it wasn't something that was hard to do because, again, she, I didn't have any expenses living at home. She didn't require me to pay anything. So that was kind of an easy decision, you know, either that or give it to her. Right, right. And so I, I, I can appreciate her forcing that on me. And she meant what she said. She said, hey, if you can't, if, you, if you're going to blow your money, just give it to me because um, yeah. I'll know what to do with it. So that was a hard lesson to swallow, but it was an easy decision to make. Well, you know? clearly so, you, you, you're a, a very wise mother, number <laughs> one. But the, the, the other thing I think is important, particularly for younger people, um, I think it's important for everyone. But I, I tell people, if I could think of the, 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 uh, especially when I was in my 20s and my 30s. Uh, and not that I, you're not supposed to have fun. Yeah, you can have fun. And, and you know, we're not talking about, like you said, being stingy with yourself or anybody else. But I just think of the, the, the if I had 50% of the money I spent going yes. dancing and, you yes. know, and, and going, going to hang out with my friends, if I only took half of that, I still could have went out with my friends. I still would have had a good time. 
Um, and and uh, Travis, I, I'm going to tell you the, the best piece. I shared it often on this show. The best piece of it, financial advice I ever got that if I was if I had to do it over again, I would have done it when I was younger. I started doing it when I got the advice, but about then I was in my late 30s. Mm-hmm. I was told, bank your raises. So let's say you're making, I don't know, 50000 a year, and you get a raise to fifty five. Go as I was told, go as long as you can without right. spending the extra five. Right. Because to your point, you think, oh, 50% of my income, how is that going to happen? And I was like, what do you mean don't spend my raise? But he's like, you were right. living on that other salary just fine just before fine. you got the raise. So he's like, even if you just wait six months before you start letting your lifestyle spend that extra money, that's six but months about times, times five, you know, whatever. You know, that could be, you know, in a bank or invested or something. Right. Yeah. But think you about know, this. And, and I was like, I tell young people all the time, you, 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 sometimes your salary goes down, like you said, but That's if you right. have money saved up, then you're good. But when your salary goes up, don't be so quick to spend it all. You know? That's right. You think, know. think about this, Alfred. What do we do when we get what do we do when we get a raise? We upgrade our lifestyle. Oh yeah. We get a bigger house. Yep. We get a bigger there's nothing wrong with the house that you're in now. You know, if you got a a, a, a as your family is growing and the need Make yeah, sure. that's different. But we we automatically move into a bigger house, better yeah. neighborhood. We drive. We want to upgrade. We want bigger cars, and so what we do is over time, as we make more money, we shift that lifestyle. Yes, yes. Instead of having a delayed gratification, instead of saying, "Okay, let me like you said, wait, let me wait, let me put a little something aside." Right, and, and it's not even waiting money. forever. That that was the question. Right. Like it's you not could forever. go six to twelve months, you'll be fine. Right. Right. Then if you want to ball out, go ball out. But you you had the right. you know, so you're right. you're right. But this other thing you just said, because the 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 the, the most common thread or the most common you know kind of value that I've heard over the years, and I've interviewed people who generated wealth all kinds of ways. They did it as entrepreneurs, they did it because they had highly successful corporate careers, they might have done it because they were successful in investing. It's usually a combination of all three. But mm-hmm. the one commonality that all wealth creators have said to me in over the years as I've been doing this work for Black Enterprise, is that the common denominator of all successful wealth builders is the concept of delayed gratification. Right. That if you can delay gratification, whether you're building your wealth through real estate or you're doing it because you're just building a career and you're not letting your lifestyle eat up your raises or you're doing it but building a business, like you said, right. you had to take a step, a 20000 step dollar a year step back before you could step forward into building this well, you step business. forward. So talk Absolutely. to me, about, did, did, was that delayed gratification something else that your mother instilled in you, or that was something that you kind of figured out over time? Well, I think a little bit of that, but I think as, as like you said, as we transition and get older, um, because when I, back in 2010, I, I actually started my business in 2009, mm-hmm. in uh, November of 2009, and, and uh, a year later, I kind of had to step back and make a decision because the business was growing, and I had to kind of do some had to kind of do some soul searching and I really felt my career uh, wasn't going the way I wanted it to go. I feel like I've maxed out in terms of the amount of the amount of money where I was. I kind of did a 10 year went, I did a 10 year look back Mm -hmm. and I went and told my wife, I said, I feel like I'm stuck. And I made the conscious decision to lunge out on my own and actually start my business because I felt like I can be free. I can set my own terms in terms of, what I want to do and what I didn't want to do. So I took a step back and I, and, and again, I did that analogy d- decided what I needed to do. Like you said, I took that, I took that step backwards delayed. That was a delayed gratification. I went backwards and say, okay, you know, let me, let me kind of take my investments and reoccur it and re and put it into my business. So, you know, yeah, I, I gave myself a $20,000 pay cut, but it, the, the extra money to that, that I, I didn't bring home, I just turned it and put it back into the business. And so now I'm making, it, it was a form of making an, making an investment. Now I'm making an investment in myself. So, you know, through that journey, it just allowed, it just, it just opened up my, my perspective on, you know, looking forward. And so um, I went to several years. Of course, you know, when you start a business, you, you got several years before you actually start to, to show a profit. Right. And one of the things I used to do is, Worry about paying all my bills. Let me make sure everybody's paid. And I'm the last person getting paid until I started learning. Hey, the purpose of being a business owner 
is pay yourself first. You know, you know, meaning pull out and always put, you know, put some money aside. And so, you know, as a result, I started holding back. Whatever we did, we would we would keep 10%, whether that was a week, a month. So we started putting 10% of the of the of the weekly or monthly profits, we would put that to the side. And it was amazing how that how that money accumulated. And now we were able to invest in other things because of that pop just grew. We almost like a set it and forget it. And I think that's how we need to do our lifestyle, you know, our personal lives. Every time you get paid, put a little something aside, you know. You do have your savings and you do have your investing. And I think if if you do those things, then what we have, what we kind of call, I just learned, I, I just saw this term a little, a, a little, maybe a couple of weeks ago, you have guilt-free money, right? So of course you got your, your expenses, which technically is really about 50%, you know, of your, of your, of your um, income. And then if you do your, if you do 20 or 30% into your savings and investing, the other money, the other money can be guilt free and nobody can nobody can tell you what you can and can't do with that money. As long as you've done the other two things, you know, prior to actually you, you know, have your have your guilt free spending. And we all have our habits. Yeah. As you know, mine is clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. My habit is clothes. Some people it may be, you know, be, be, they may be, be cars, fine it could be cars, shoes, whatever. Right. It can be whatever. So as long as we take care of the other things, then we can have what we kind of call our guilt free spending. Yeah, that idea of, of, of guilt free spending. Of, of, mm-hmm. Again, I'm not a I'm a financial journalist. I'm not a financial expert. And I always draw that line. I'm not. Right. I've learned a lot of the years because I've been at a financial publication and media company for so many years. But my passion for the subject matter is about emotions and behavior. And guilt is a big part of the emotions and behaviors of how people handle money. And right. I, I, I stress to people, yeah, if you, you know, if, if you if you change your orientation about the way you think about money, your feelings about money will change, and that makes it easier for your behaviors to change. Great example, right. you know, we, we're we're all taught, and you, I think you mentioned it, the very important rule of setting aside a percentage aside of every dollar you make for emergencies or just for a mm-hmm. set, of, you know that you don't spend all of it. You spend right. 80% of it and put the other, you know, 90% of it to the side. And of course, we know of that as kind of the emergency fund. Mm-hmm. And again, a, a person I interviewed many years ago said to me, she said, suppose you take the terminology around that and instead of calling it an emergency fund, calling it an opportunity fund. That's right. And I was like, yeah, he says, suppose you're right now, you don't think you're going to quit your job anytime soon. But if you decide to, your opportunity fund is there, and instead of you going right. and beg for money, you got money right. to start your business. Or let's say, you know, you, you, you're not really paying attention to the stock market, but if somebody goes, hey, here's a chance for you to buy, you know, this, you know, and invest, instead of you saying, I ain't got no money to do it, you say, well, actually, I got my opportunity fund. I got my I opportunity fund. From. And the, the minute she said, I was like, yeah. And it's a lot more fun to save for an opportunity fund than it is to save for an emergency fund because nobody wants to think about that kind of emergency, even though you should be prepared for it. So, so again, your your whole concept of you know, if you if you really are disciplined about what to do with every dollar you get, there's always a percentage that's left over. That's like if you love shoes, who cares if you have five hundred pairs of shoes? If you love you know travel, because I'm I'm at the stage of my life where I love travel, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I want to be free to travel. So it, it's about options and freedom and not feeling guilty about our hard earned money. You work hard for your money. That's right. You know? That's so right. T- talk to me now, it, it, you know, as I'm looking at the clock going by fast, I know it's going to have, have fun with you, but um, how, you know, again, you're, you're a husband, you're a father, you have, you have children of your own. You, you have to be also thinking about not only the lessons you're teaching um, and in the culture of your family, but also, what your financial goals are going forward in terms of what you want to happen going forward. And obviously for future generations, you know, at black enterprise, we say, if it's not multi-generational, it's not real wealth that we have to start thinking right. more about, okay, what happens? Um, or what do we like to happen? What do we like to position um, our, our um, future generations as a result of the choices and the lessons we were taught to them about money. So talk to me a little bit about that, where you are right now. Um, what are the kind of lessons that you're carrying on? What are the new lessons? 
um, that maybe some in some ways your kids are teaching you. Because I got adult children. Sometimes they're teaching me stuff now. <laughs> they're like, oh, dad, <laughs> you need to think about that this way. So just, just give me a little glimpse of both the present and, and your future outlook, if you will, in terms of your the lessons and emotions and thoughts about money. Okay. Well, yeah. So like right now I have a 19 and a 21 year old, uh, two sons. And so I can go back as far as when they were middle school, uh, just we, we uh, middle school and high school. And we have this thing in our, in our home that we do, uh, me and my wife, uh, me and my, my wife and I, we actually do what we call yearly, yearly meetings, family meetings. And so we, each of us pick a different topic on things that we want to discuss. And of course, Dad's is always talking about money um, and not just not just the concrete money that we spend every day. It's just about making sure we have the proper things set up in place. You know, we talk about insurance. You know, uh, I've been talking to them since they've been you know younger. What's the difference between a whole life policy and a and a term policy? And why do you have you know, why do you need to vote? What's the benefits of, you know, one over the other? What's the purpose of investing and saving your money? I mean, because one of the things I believe is you, you mentioned, you know, wealth is generational that, yeah, I can have a, a, a $500,000 policy, you know, on myself and my, my family is the beneficiary or I can leave it to my kids. But if, if, if you dumped a, a half million dollars in, in a child's lap and he hadn't been properly, he or she hadn't been properly trained on what they need to do, then all they did, all you did was just left them a bunch of money and you hadn't taught them how to what they're supposed to do. Now, you know, I believe in having stuff properly structured, uh, you know, through a through a trust, through a trust fund. And a lot of people think, oh, that sounds like rich folk talk. No, a trust fund is just basically when you leave a trust, you're just being able to specifically give instructions on the things that you leave behind, whether it be your material possessions or your wealth. So that's the one thing I think that we lack is just having those conversations about uh, generational wealth. It's a buzzword right now that you hear all over, you know, people, everybody talking about, oh, I'm setting up legacy and generational wealth. Well, what we fail to realize is wealth, generational wealth is it can it continues on and on from generation to generation. And there's been a foundation set up. Just leaving your children a bunch of money is not generational wealth. You know, sometimes that can be generational catastrophe because now you open up some things and opportunities that they are able to take advantage of because they didn't have money. But if you have the things properly set up. So going back to, you know, we talk about that a lot in our home, um, you know, talking about saving, investing. Uh, one of the things I always drill into, into my sons is as, as my wife, as my mother, she did me the same way. Just making sure you have your stuff set up in the beginning. Mm. So, you know, I, I have what we call what is what is your freedom number? I, hit, I, I say that all the time. And the freedom number is owning your 24 hours. Right. So what do you have to do if I didn't have to work another day? How long could I live off of that money? Or I own my 24 hours, meaning I can choose to do what I want. And, yeah. and I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not beholden to going to a job or going to my business. So I think while we're young and I tell them all the time, while you're young, save as much as you can while you have the energy to do so. So when you get in your latter years or if you want to retire in your 40s, you can do that. You know, you know. Uh, that, 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 that idea of wealth is time. And that, that's something I, I started learning, you know, maybe, you know, I would say 20, 25 years ago, but it didn't really hit me for real until during the economic shutdown of the pandemic when I had nothing but time on my hands. And, you know, uh, and I was like, you know, I started this journey back now. It's been about eight or nine years ago where I said my wealth goal is to only do only get paid to do what I actually want to do. You know, to to you know that that hundred percent of what I do for a living, whatever that is, is what I actually want to do. Versus, I don't really want to do this, but they're paying me enough to do it, and I need it. I need it to have the life that I want. And you know, depending on the month, I feel like I'm seventy five to eighty percent there. I mean, it helps that I work at Black Enterprise, and I love that. So that takes up a lot of my time. But I just remember when I was, you know, when I got into my mid 40s saying, you know what, I just want to get to the point where I'm doing the things I want to do and I'm getting paid well to do it in one way or another. Because, you know, whether it's a business or whether it's a salary or whatever, or doing your know, investment returns, but I'm spending my time doing what I really want to do. And a lot of what I want to do, I wouldn't get paid anything for. You know, I, I'm a 
I'm, I'm a supporter of arts institutions, um, the Harold Washington Cultural Center in Chicago. Uh, I want to be able to do stuff for my alma mater or for my church and not be worried about, well, I'm not actually getting paid for this, so how am I going to do this? No, I just want to be able to do it, you know. Yeah. And, and so this idea of time freedom is something that I didn't really start experience or understanding or thinking about until, you know, again, the, the, maybe the last 15, 20 years of my life, because that's a very long way away from the mindset that I had as, you know, the oldest son of a divorced single mother raising four children by herself, when it was just manage your money to the penny, you know, so we can we can make it from week to week and, and be responsible and be disciplined. All good lessons, but I had to even grow in terms of my perception of what money and wealth was about over the years is is, is my, my um, life has changed and evolved. Mm -hmm. so, so, and again, like you said, my kids, um, you know, uh, my kids are, are older than your kids. My, my younger kids are in their um, early 30s. They came out of like high school and college way ahead of me in terms right. of, you know, appreciation and understanding of things like, you know, managing credit and like you said, saving and investing. And, uh, and in a way that was inevitable because, you know, I, I tell my kids, your grandmother didn't have her own credit score. And, you know, mm -hmm. in, until the you know, 70s, women didn't have a credit score that wasn't attached to a husband. And, wow. and, uh, and it wasn't legal for you to know your own credit score until during my lifetime. So a lot of the progress that we are trying to make um, are just a matter of the evolution from generation to generation of right. access to financial information and knowledge that our parents and grandparents didn't have. Yeah. And, and, and I think the one thing that we have to do is now that we have the information, because, again, we didn't we just wasn't privy to a lot of information that's out there. I mean, you think about it. You go back in the, the 90s. How easy was it for you to buy a stock, a piece of the owner to buy a share of stock then as it is now? You can download an app on your phone. You can load some money in your account and you can buy a share. Back then, it was physically you had to call a broker and it was a it was a piece of paper. Right. You know, you and got shares in the mail. You were a broker. <laughs> yeah, so you had to go through a broker and then the fees that was attached to it that was just so astronomical. So in today's times, it's so much easier. But what we have to do is we have to, we still have broken and bad habits mm -hmm. with money. And so I think if we can fix the habits, because it's just been, we just never been taught, or if we've been taught to be savers. Even to be a saver is not a, just a saver is not a good thing in, to, in today's times because your money gets eaten up by inflation. Yeah, so that, that's, that's the thing I learned the hard way, man. I, I had to learn you can't save your way to wealth. Right. Like savings is good, I, but you can't save good. your way to wealth. Yeah. And, 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 and in all honesty, it wasn't until about, you know, 10 years ago that I had to learn that. Um, because we thought, okay, I can put my money. If I work for a company, I can put my money in a four hundred one k, and I'm good. Well, still, that's just not enough, you know, because fees are going to get eaten up. You still need to do that. I'm not telling you not to invest in your four hundred one k at your job, but you need to do something outside of just. And so now we just have such a plethora of information now, you know, outside of all the noise of talking about the the latest and greatest, which what's, what's going to get rich. Because what I did learn is what I have learned. Is there's no there is no quick way to wealth. Wealth is not an overnight thing. It's a marathon. And so the longer you're in, the more you can make. And that's what going back to what you talked about with my sons, for me to get it in them early, you know, and for them to understand it and for me to, you know, pound it into them. Hey, do this. I promise you, if you do this, you'll be so much further along. And then if you get laid off your job in your 40s, it's OK. It's, it's not it's not it's not death or it's not the end of the world because you're number one. You hadn't built your lifestyle above and beyond what you can do. You got some emergency fund or your freedom fund, as we call it, or opportunity, as you call it, which I love that term. Um, opportunity. Your opportunity fund is if an opportunity come up and I need to use it. Hey, it's there. Or you've got enough set in your retirement that if you wanted to at 45, you're working because you want to, not because you have to. And that's what you the said way, the people who are most successful in their careers, if they're going to stay, because I tell you, there's nothing wrong with having a corporate career, but the people who are most successful are the ones that actually want to do what they're doing. As I there's nothing worse than the person that's getting paid good money, but they're coming home and they're kicking the dog and they're arguing with their wife and they got, you know, because they hate what they do, you know, and, as, and the question becomes, especially as you get older, is the price you're paying in terms of your emotional health, your mental health, your physical health, 
worth whatever they're paying you if you hate doing it. Um, and, and so that idea of it, it, when you're young, set it up so you have options because you might love doing it for five years and then year six, you may hate it. Well, then you say, okay, year six, I'm going to do something different. But you, it's hard to do that. We, we both um, and, and, you know, know people who are kind of almost trapped in what they're doing, but they literally can't afford to, to do anything else or they can't take the risk. And that, that, that's the other thing I want to get before. I know we're running out of time, but uh, you, you strike me. I'm going to give you a, a, an analogy that another entrepreneur I interviewed last week gave me. She said, I'm conservative when it comes to money. I'm, I'm risk averse when it comes to money, but I'm a risk taker when it comes to opportunity. And I was like, that's just very interesting. She said, yeah, I'm not someone, I want my money, I'm managing my money tight, but I recognize that to build wealth, I got it. And she was saying in the context similar to yours, it was a risk for her to leave and establish, in her case, corporate career to go and start. In fact, her, her story is very similar to yours. She started as an e-commerce business too, but to go decide, I'm going to do this. And so she said, while I was conservative about my money, and I still am, I've learned that to build wealth, you got to be able to take some risk. And I'm, risk, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take risk for opportunity. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I guess to, to kind of, to kind of, uh, kind of jump on, uh, kind of, I guess people use the term piggyback, yeah. just as an entrepreneur, it, it opened up the doors to, for me to look at so many different other things. Mm. You know, uh, when I was working, I was comfortable getting a, a two week check. Every two weeks, that check was being direct deposited into my account. But when I got on my own, it just made me look at, you know, streams of income. You know, we hear that all the time. What are streams of income? Now, not, not multiple jobs, because some of us do 50 things and we say, I got multiple streams of income. No, you just got 50 jobs or you got three jobs because it literally takes it takes you to participate in order for you to get paid. But what can I do and what can I what, what can I put my money in? that will create a stream of income that will allow me to generate money without me having to physically participate in that activity. You know, so you hear it all the time, you know, entrepreneurship is a stream. Your job is a stream of income because you work for money, but you can invest, you know, you can invest in someone's business, you know, rents, royalties, you can get in, involved in real estate. There's so many different avenues that open up my eyes, open up when I got into the world of entrepreneurship that just, I just didn't look, you know, it, it forced me to really build my own. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with having a job. It's just, I had to do a self-assessment with myself to say, I feel like I'm going nowhere in my career. And I just wasn't happy. And it just felt like I was going to work and getting the check and, and providing for my family. There was no, no gratification, right. you know, in that. So that's not everybody's story. You said earlier, we, some people love to do what they do. And that's and good. There's nothing do. wrong with yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with with the, with the cor with the corporate world if if you love what you do, right? You know, right. Um, and you, you feel know. like you're getting rewarded both financially and psychologically and psychologically. For, for what right. You're doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Listen, Travis, I so enjoyed this conversation. Before I let you go, what's the best way for the Beyond the Hype audience to you know to follow up on you know suit yourself whether they go online order it or they go to, to uh, Columbia to get it or and to follow you on social media. What's the best way for people to learn more and, and to uh, get involved with your, in supporting your business? Yes. So, of course, uh, for those who are not in the Columbia area or for those who are in the Columbia area, I am in Columbia on um, Two Notch Road, 10223 Two Notch Road. But for those who are not local, you can visit us online, uh, suityourselfmenswear.com. Also, you can follow us uh, on uh, social media platforms, on Facebook and Instagram, uh, Suit Yourself Menswear, all one word. And then, of course, if you want to, you know, kind of see me, um, of course, I'm Travis Shula on Instagram as well, because I'm, I'm a very family oriented man um, that I feel like, you know, a lot of people tell me, hey, are you going to leave this to your children? No, what I, they don't want to do what I do. But what I have put in them, I've, I've put into them the spirit of owning your own and entrepreneurship and legacy. And so that's what makes me feel good. I'm a family man. I'm a businessman. And again, yeah, come come check us out at Suit Yourself Menswear um, in Columbia. Or again, like I say, you can visit us online. Well, I'm telling you now, I'm coming down there. I'm going to figure out when I'm going to get there, but I'm coming down there. I want to see what you got going. But I see Absolutely. on the website looks good. So I'm looking forward to it. Travis, thank you so much for being my guest on Beyond the Hype. Thank you very much. Have a great day.
Okay, guys, another great edition of Beyond the Hype. Great conversation. Uh, I got to talk about fashion since I can't believe I get paid to do this, but I'm taking the money anyway, taking the money and running. Uh, thank you for joining us. This episode of Beyond the Hype is brought to you by New York Life. I'm Alfred Emmy Jr. Uh, take care of yourself, and we'll see you next time.